My sincere thanks to Sacred Heart College and the principal of that college, Father Tom Lynch, for inviting me to deliver the third annual Jumeau Lecture. I'm honoured to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Randy Boyagoda, former principal of the University of St. Mike's, novelist, biographer, and now University of Toronto administrator, who spoke in 2018 on Catholicism in the public square, and the Reverend Dr. Andrew Bennett, current director of the Cardis Religious Freedom Institute, and formerly Canada's ambassador and head of the Office for Re Religious Freedom, who spoke in 2019 on living a public faith, a Catholic's duty. My 2020 contribution is entitled, Clear Heads and Holy Hearts, Lay Catholic Spirituality According to St. John Henry Cardinal Newman. While my talk stands in it as, on its own and does not require knowledge of the previous lectures, it does in its own way complement them to form a triptych by speaking to the lay spirituality which undergirds the public engagement advocated by Boyagoda and Bennett and the renewed mission of Sacred Heart College to equip missionary disciples for the new evangelization. Let me set the stage for my talk by specifying what I mean by the words of my title, Catholic spirituality. There are numerous ways of defining what is meant by spirituality within the Catholic sphere. For the sake of my talk, I refer to those interrelated practices, beliefs, and attitudes which shape the contours of our lives relative to living as Catholics. In short, spirituality is our intentional living out of a life conceived and enacted specifically as a Catholic life. Lay Catholic spirituality. By lay spirituality, I refer to the intentional living out of Catholic life by those baptized into Christ without further differentiation. So I refer to the practices, beliefs, and attitudes of the baptized striving to live a Catholic life without distinction of citizenship, ethnicity, language, sex, age, profession, vocation, avocation, politics, education, training, class, sexual attraction, income, or similar sociological marker. This is neither to homogenize persons nor deny their unique, incommunicable distinctiveness, but it is to emphasize that the distinctive characteristic of lay spirituality is our baptism into Christ. All other steps along the pilgrim's path to eternal life flow from the baptismal configuration of our lives to Christ, so that through the power, presence, and person of the Holy Spirit, we may say with St. Paul, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. So while the ordained draw upon baptism relative to their entrance into sacred priesthood, and religious draw upon baptism relative to, relative to living out their embrace of the evangel evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, lay persons draw upon baptism relative to those endeavors commitments, vows, offices, obligations, relationships, or adventures which we undertake. Lay Catholic spirituality according to St. John Henry Cardinal Newman. In our brief time together, I draw my insights almost exclusively from the witness, writings, and wisdom of the Englishman John Henry Newman, whose life spanned the 19th century first as an Anglican academic at Oxford, and subsequently as a Catholic convert, priest, pastor, founder of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in England, a cardinal, a thinker, a poet, a novelist, a controversialist, an educationalist, a correspondent to thousands, and perhaps the most consequential Catholic theologian of the past 500 years, who was raised to the sanctity of the altar on the 13th of October 2019. Because so much of what Newman wrote prior to his Catholic conversion was hewed from sacred scripture and the fathers of the church, those aspects of his thought upon which I draw, whether as an Anglican or as a Catholic, form part of the great tradition which transmits authentic Catholic teaching across the ages. My talk then unfolds in three sections. Section one, this section, provides an introduction to Newman's life relative to his conversions and explores his teaching on the spirit-filled nature of baptism. Section two considers the shape of holiness according to Newman. 
Section 3 concludes by asking, how might Newman consider the renewal of our minds for effective engagement and mission? In short, by drawing upon Newman's witness writings and wisdom, I make a few observations as to how the contemporary baptized layperson might fruitfully conceive, perceive, and enact an authentically Catholic life. In so doing, while remaining faithful to St. John Henry's spirit, I neither pret pretend to present whole his thought nor, rate, nor narrate a potted history of his life. To adapt one of his aphorisms, Catholic spirituality is a deep matter. One cannot put it in a teacup. Very English aphorism. Part one, conversion. In his essay, Exploring Newman in the Convert Mine, Sheridan Gilly, one of his premier biographers, cites the experience of one modern Roman convert, Muriel Spark. Let's let Muriel stand in for a host of others. Newman is far less dead to me than many of my contemporaries, and less dead even than Socrates, for whom, in the daydreams of my young youth, I thought it would be lovely to lay down my life. It was by way of Newman that I turned Roman Catholic. Not all of the beheaded martyrs of Christendom, the ecstatic nuns of Europe, the five proofs of Aquinas, or the pamphlets of my Catholic acquaintance, provided anything like the answers that Newman did. At the Beatification Mass on the 19th of September 2010, Pope Benedict XVI impressed the Church's infallible seal on the integrity of Newman's life as a disciple of our Lord. During his homily, Papa Ratzinger said, England has a long tradition of martyr saints whose courageous witness has sustained and inspired the Catholic community here for centuries. Yet it is right and fitting that we should recognize today the holiness of a confessor, a son of this nation who, while not called to shed his blood for the Lord, nevertheless bore eloquent witness to him in the course of a long life devoted to priestly ministry, and especially to preaching, teaching, and writing. He is worthy. He is worthy to take his place in a long line of saints and scholars from these islands, St. Bede, St. Hilda, St. Alred, Blessed Duns Scotus, to name but a few. In Blessed John Henry, that tradition of gentle scholarship, deep human wisdom, and profound love for the Lord has borne rich fruit as a sign of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit deep within the heart of God's people, bringing forth abundant gifts of holiness. Mindful that many who are listening and following us today are not acquainted with Newman's life, I will now sketch accounts of three conversions in which he underwent a lasting change in how he thought, acted, and loved because of his cooperation with God's grace. First conversion from skepticism to evangelical Anglicanism, 1801-1816. John Newman's life spanned more of the 19th century than Queen Victoria's. He was born in 1801 and died in 1890. We should apply Newman's comments about St. Cyril of Alexandria to himself. We may hold St. Cyril to be a great servant of God without considering ourselves obliged to defend certain passages of his ecclesiastical career. According to his biographer, Lutheran convert and oratorian theologian Louis Bouillet, Newman's early religious formation reflected the plainness, power, and poverty of his parents' Protestantism, which centered upon the reading of sacred scripture and the Book of Common Prayer. By the age of 15, his religiosity was being sapped by a skepticism absorbed from his reading of Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Paine, David Hume, and Voltaire. The more things change, the more they stay the same, eh? He drifted in their direction. His unexpected evangelical conversion, though, in 1816 was occasioned by the collapse of his father's bank, a severe illness, 
and especially the pious influence of his teacher, Mr. Walter Mayers. Recalling this event in his 1864 work, Apologia Pro Vita Sua, he wrote, When I was 15, in the autumn of 1816, a great change of thought took place in me. I fell under the influences of a definite creed and received into my intellect impressions of dogma, which through God's mercy have never been effaced or obscured. Above and beyond the conversations and sermons of the excellent man long dead, the Reverend Walter Mayers of Pembroke College, Oxford, who was the human means of this beginning of divine faith in me, was the effect of the books which he put into my hands, all of the school of Calvin. A decade after the event, he recorded this in his private journal. In the matter in question, that is, my own conversion, my feelings were not violent, but a returning to, a renewing of principles under the power of the Holy Spirit, which I already felt, and in a measure, acted on when young. Despite Newman's hesitancy to speak unguardedly of himself or his conversion as evangelical, this adjective is not wholly misplaced. He displayed a heightened sensitivity to God's presence in or the ordinary affairs of his life. His concern for holiness was reflected in his adoption of these twin maxims as a guide for life from the evangelical writer Thomas Scott. Holiness rather than peace and growth the only evidence of life. Pretty good maxims. He was involved with the British and Foreign Bible Society and showed deep interest in biblical prophecy, missionary work, gospel doctrines like the atonement and key doctrinal tenets of reformed Christianity. In short, he was an evangelical. Second conversion, 1824 to 1833, from Anglican evangelicalism to Anglo-Catholicism. So Newman, as they say, went up to Oxford as an evangelical in 1817, earned a mediocre BA in 1820, and then surprised everyone by his election as a fellow of Oriel College, the contemporary symbol of English intellectual prowess and guardian of the Anglican tradition. In 1825, he was ordained an Anglican priest, and in view of his pastoral experiences with flesh and blood parishioners, soon parted ways with his acceptance of a Calvinist evangelicalism, which had too neatly separated souls into the saved and the damned. In 1828, he tragically lost his dear sister, Mary, was appointed vicar of the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin, and preached in its pulpit until 1843, the result of which was his eight-volume spiritual classic, Parochial and Plain Sermons. Most importantly, he had begun to read the Fathers of the Church. Third conversion, 1833 to 1845, from Anglo-Catholicism within the Anglican Church to Roman Catholicism. Between 1833 and 1843, largely as a fruit of reading the Fathers, Newman energized and led the efforts of the Oxford movement, comprised of those who understood the Church of England to be a branch of what they called the Church Catholic, alongside or separated Roman Catholic and Orthodox sister churches. By mid-1843, circumstances made it clear to him that the Church of England, his own church, did not hold with his Catholicizing position. He resigned his pastorate, retreated a few miles outside of Oxford to Littlemore, and after a period of soul-searching, intense prayer, fasting and study, during which he penned the theological classic, an essay on the development of Christian doctrine. And in 1845, at the hands of Blessed Dominic Barbary, a Passionist priest, on one, as they say, dark and stormy night on the 9th of October, he became a Roman Catholic. Roman Catholicism, 1845 to 1890. 
Ordained a Catholic priest in 1847, Newman brought the Oratory of St. Philip Neri to Birmingham and London. In 1851, at the invitation of Archbishop Cullen of Dublin, he became rector of the first Irish Catholic University, which endeavor led him to articulate the purpose and design of an authentic liberal arts education in his still relevant, the idea of a university. During the 1850s and 60s, Newman weathered a series of disappointments. The London Oratory opted to operate as a house independent of his spiritual fatherhood. He was unjustly convicted of libel for stepping up and defending the Catholic Church against vicious slander in what is called the Achille trial. The English bishops invited him to supervise a new translation of the Bible. That's just one sign of how deeply learned he was. And then after costs were incurred and work underway, they let their invitation wither on the vine. Bishop Brown of Newport accused Newman de Rome of serious theological error in what the historians call the Rambler Affair. Rome requested through the office of the chief Catholic churchman in England, Henry Cardinal Manning, that Newman respond to this accusation. But somehow Cardinal Manning withheld this request from Newman so that he labored under a cloud of curial suspicion for seven years. Finally, many of his countrymen continued to regard him as that most un-English of things, a deceiver who as an Anglican had lived as a closet Catholic prior to his Romeward move. Now everything changed in 1864, when in a concentrated burst of energy, writing for, for up to 18 hours a day, he produced in less than two months a history of his religious opinions, his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which upon its syndicated publication in pamphlet form, on seven consecutive Thursdays in April and May, captured the imagination of the nation. The spur to this achievement was the public slur by novelist and Cambridge Regis Professor of Modern History, Charles Kingsley, who said in print, Truth for its own sake has never been a virtue with the Roman clergy. Father Newman informs us that it need not and on the whole ought not to be. The appearance of the Apologia helped even adversaries to understand that Newman's conversion to Roman Catholicism was not the result of sinning against the light, but indeed was following the path of conscience. In 1870, Newman published his essay in aid of a grammar of assent, which the doyne of Newman studies, Father Ian Carr, has called, quote, his one important book, which was long meditated and premeditated. Father Edward Caswell, a member of the Birmingham Oratory and a well-known hymn writer, wrote on the flyleaf of his presentation copy, the gist of the grammar based upon a comment by Newman, Father Caswell object of the book twofold. In the first part shows you can believe what you cannot understand. He meant at least fully. In the second part that you can believe what you cannot absolutely prove. When Newman cited St. Ambrose in the inset of his grammar, not by means of logic was God pleased to save his people, he was not endorsing an anti-rational sentiment but aligning the Bishop of Milan's insight with his own contention that the flexible, complex, and subtle movements of human reason can surpass or even bypass strict demonstration in attaining a valid conclusion. In 1878, the inaugural year of his pontificate, against advice to the contrary, Pope Leo XIII made Newman a cardinal. And to her credit, England understood the honoring of her son as an honoring of the nation. Newman's cardinalatio motto was indebted to St. Francis de Sales and encapsulates his thought and theology. Cor et cor loquitur. That is, heart speaks to heart. Though by no means sedate, 
The remaining 12 years of Newman's life passed without the controversy which had typified much of his life. At his death in 1890, he was one of the most respected persons of the realm and had garnered the respect, if not the affection, of much of his island home.